Hi, this is Deb Benny Morgan, and you're listening to The Spirit of Now, created out of Zeitgeist in order to talk to interesting people on the spiritual spectrum, spectrum and get to know more about the voices that are out there adding to the evolution of spiritual ideas. And today, I'm very excited to introduce you to Dr. Sherry Kling. She's an author teacher, consultant, and coach who draws from wisdom and mystical traditions, we love that, relational (laughs) worldviews, depth psychology, and the intersection of spirituality and science, we love that too, to help people transform their lives so they can experience meaning, belonging, and positive change. She's the founder of Deeper Rhythm and creator of the Transforming Women program for women's personal and professional development. And you can see the show notes for the link to her website, which is sherrykling.com. So Sherry, very welcome to the show. We're excited to talk to you today. Thanks so much, Debbie. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. See, she's a fun and exciting place. <laughs> it is. It really is. You, you're talking to different people and bringing in ideas and that's really important yeah. now. Yeah. Especially yeah. around spirituality. Right. And, and one of the things that we're known for at ZG is we are an interfaith, interspiritual group. And so we are very open to the different ways that people talk about their spiritual lives or relationship to uh, we'll shortcut and say God, although we don't like to 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 pigeonhole anything, especially with language. So let me ask you, Sherry, just to get the ball rolling, what is the language you use around what many people would call God? Yeah, so I, um, there's a theologian named John Cobb, who's a process mm-hmm. theologian. I know we're going to talk a little bit about process theology in a minute. Yeah. And John, John Cobb describes God as a unitary actuality that is supremely worthy of worship and or commitment. Now, wow. yeah, I think that's Break a that really- Break down for us. <laughs> yeah, a unitary <laughs> actuality that is supremely worthy of worship and or commitment. Now, mm. I also love though- Uh, Reverend Michael Dowd talks about God as just big reality. And Father Richard Rohr talks about God as reality with a face. Mm -hmm. And I love those terms. And I I also love the way Carl Jung talks about the primordial mystery and that Mm -hmm. primordial level of experience of the rushing flow of life that is at the base of human experience. And he believed that when humans encounter that rushing river of life Mm -hmm. in a way that takes us out of our mundane lives, that that is encountering what religions point to as God. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you mentioned Jung. And you mentioned process theology. These are things that have informed your journey. So tell us a little bit more about that. I think process theology might be new to some of our listeners. Yeah. So process theology, I would say, is a a contemporary, more contemporary theology that is um, friendly to science. And uh, it's based on the philosophy of Alfred North Whitehead. Now, Whitehead died, I think, in 1947, Um, and so he was writing, he was, he was British and was really known as a mathematician and also physicist, and he wrote a a very important text called Principia Mathematica with Bertrand Russell, Mm -hmm. and so he then really became known in the 1920s as a philosopher of uh, writing on the philosophy of science. And so Harvard invited him to come and teach at Harvard in the in the early 20s. And that's really where he spent the rest of his life and career. And and so his philosophy and he called it he didn't use the term process philosophy. He used Mm -hmm. he called his philosophy a philosophy of organism, which was in contrast to philosophies of mechanism that were very popular at the time and still are popular. Right, and so right. his idea was that reality is like an organism. It's not like a machine. Mm-hmm. And he thought mm-hmm. that everything is always in the process of becoming. That that actual reality is not based at, at when you go, go down to the 
the most minute level of things. It's not based on substances that stay the same through time. So substance metaphysics yes, would yes, be based on yes. the idea that at its at its root, at its most fine detail, reality is made up of inert stuff or material that's pushed around by external forces like billiard balls on a pool table. Mm -hmm. But he said, no, reality is event-based. What we're seeing based on the writings of Darwin and evolution, of, he was writing after Einstein, he was writing after quantum mechanics was first discovered. And the way just that we know that nothing stays the same through time. So reality for him it is not like a solid line that stays the same through time. It's more like a dotted line. And that's made up of drops of experience, momentary actualities that come into being mm. and then perish and come into being and perish. So there's this creative advance that's always happening. So his work, and he talks in his philosophy about God, and he has certain functions that he believes that God plays in the cosmos that are necessary. Um, so he does talk about God, but then other people took his work, Charles Hartshorn, and then John Cobb, David Ray Griffin, Marjorie Sue Hockey, Catherine Keller. These are all um, process theologians. Now, also process theology, though, has been used in dialogue with Buddhism, it's, there are Islamic thinkers writing from a process, process, process perspective, and there are Jewish writers writing from a process perspective. There's, and of course, secular. There are people who disagree with Whitehead that God is necessary at all. And they talk about creativity as sort of the ultimate in that system. Right. So, but yeah. I mean, you could argue that they're still talking about God. I think it's fascinating exactly. that he starts off you know, partnering with Bertrand Russell of all people. Yeah. And then this develops. I think that the development of those ideas is uh, an, an, an analogy for the idea itself, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. So wow. his work, um, and he, you know, his writing is very, very dense. It's very, you know, he had to basically create a whole new language of things to describe what he was trying to describe. So it can be mm -hmm. hard to read his work. Sometimes mm -hmm. the people who have interpreted his work are much easier to read and much easier to understand for- oh, And that sounds like Jung too, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and the reason that I started putting Whitehead and Jung together is that I was, um, I had heard, I had heard a reference or read a reference to process theology in a book by Christian De Quincey called Radical Nature where De Quincey mm -hmm. talks about consciousness as going all the way down, down to every level of, of being. Mm -hmm. And he points to, pointed to process theology in his book and to Whitehead. So I kind of had a thing in the back of my mind, oh, I want to learn more about that. So when I went back to school in 2009 and went to the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago, where I was doing an emphasis in religion and science and you know, interested in that intersection very much, um, the, the school next door to mine was McCormick Seminary, and Anna Case Winters is a theologian there. She offered a class in process theology. And in that class, when we were reading the textbooks, the basic sort of introductory text by John Cobb and David Griffin, that's like theologians do, sort of organizes the book by those kind of focus areas of theology, you know, the nature of God, the God world relationship. Jesus Christ, his uh, work and life. And so in the chapter on Christology, Cobb and Griffin talk about Christ as creative transformation. And when mm -hmm. I read how they described that, I thought, well, gee, this sounds an awful lot like Jung's individuation and process of individuation. Mm -hmm whereby people are creatively transformed and integrated to a more a state of more integration and psychospiritual wholeness right so which also anyway, reminds me of integral theory but that's a whole other detour well but, and and in fact people who talk about integral theory and um and uh spiral dynamics like doug king who 
has doing great work in his presence podcast on, and he calls it integral theology. He points to people like Whitehead as being right. sort of influencers on that whole sort of uh, system of, of thinking. Yeah, yeah. So I, so I was in that class and I decided, hey, I'm going to do some research on, you know, these two thinkers, um, process theology and Jung. And then, and then I found a book called Archetypal Process that had been created at, after a conference in Claremont where they had put James Hillman and other Jungians in conversation with process people. And I oh, thought, it's, gosh, it's not just so me. Exciting. I know. <laughs> this was back in the late 80s. The book was published in 1990. And I thought, mm -hmm. it's not just me that sees these resonances. So that was a rabbit hole. I went, fell down, you know, when I was in school and haven't left since. And I, I love, uh, I'll just say, you know, one more thing about what I, why I think bringing these two thinkers. I mean, you know, Whitehead, like I said, he died, I think it was in 47. Jung, he was British. Jung was Swiss. He died in 1961. He was the founder of analytical psychology. It had been, a, had been uh, working with Freud before that till they had their split. And you might think, you know, why should we care about like two dead white guys from, you know, European ancestry? Like, why should we care about them? Well, the reason that I think they are life-giving resources is because I look at the problem of our, of our society, and I would say of Western culture more broadly, not just in the US, but in the Western mm -hmm. world, as being a state of fragmentation at all levels, societally, interpersonally, and intrapersonally. We are fragmented right, and right. torn apart. And, and I think that is partly due to the worldview that we hold, that's dualistic, mechanistic, materialistic, um, patriarchal, yes. Yes. dismisses the non-rational. So Whitehead yeah. and Jung are integrating resources because, I believe, because they tell us that at the level of the cosmos and at the level of the psyche, those realities are characterized by value, interconnection or relationality, and transformation. And when we, when we can learn about that as a new way of looking at the world, both, like I said, the cosmic level and the psychic level, and then put that in combination with spiritual practices like dream work that bring us, that I give us what I call embodied experiences of wholeness, then mm -hmm. we can learn for ourselves in our own lives, that we matter, we belong, and we can experience positive change and learn that the way they see reality is actually true for us. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it sounds like you just answered the question that I, I wanted to ask you next, but I think that there's even more to espouse on that. And, and that is, what does it mean to be whole? Well, I think it can mean different things that are all kind of circling around the same center. Um, we might say, like, again, bringing in John Cobb, he talks about wholeness as being at homeness, where we have a sense of being at home. Now, Jung talks about wholeness as when we integrate the opposites within ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is both Whitehead and Jung talk, and obviously separately, they, I don't ever, I don't believe that they ever had a conversation. I'm not even sure that, that they knew about each other's work, although they might have. Um, mm -hmm. They both kind of point to a, a, certain, a certain inevitability of dualism at the heart of reality, again, at the cosmic and psychic levels. And they say that because for Jung, the psyche, the psyche has a kind of dualistic bent because it's both conscious and unconscious. So he said, because mm -hmm. we are always in tension between what is conscious to us and what is unconscious for us, that means we're always sort of at war with ourselves. We're always split against ourselves. 
So there's kind of a dualistic, that, that, that contrast of opposites or coincidence of opposites in the psyche. And he thought it was that tension between op opposing energies in the psyche that actually mm -hmm. created psychic energy. So it was essential. And that those parts of the psyche, unconscious and conscious, are always in dialogue and always in a what he called a um, compensatory relationship. So there's mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. a sense that when the conscious attitude goes too far in one direction, the unconscious will bring up material to balance it out. And Whitehead, too, talks about that there is this, again, this tension in reality between things like the many and the one. Right you know, multiplicity and oneness or unity. And so those are all kind of, um, you know, he, he says that the universe is dual because it's both transient and eternal. It's one and it's multiple. So there's this tension of these, of opposing forces, this contrast of opposites at all levels, which mm -hmm. kind of means we have a, can have a tendency toward dualism. So for Jung, mm -hmm. When we can integrate by doing shadow work, by, by making what is unconscious in us more conscious, bringing it to the light, exposing our complexes, learning what we don't know about ourselves, by integrating those things and not repressing anything, but integrating it into a whole, a more whole state, then we can become integrated, we can become more compassionate, more loving, more more capable of being in real relationship with others because we become more of an individual we become more authentic mm -hmm. so that's how i see wholeness is that sense of of whole of integration of at-homeness of self-compassion is also a big part of that and mm -hmm. that's why that's something that i'm still learning i mean all of it is you know right. we never get we never get to be oh i'm done now i finished i've i'm whole i've completed I the journey that finish line yeah, yeah. there's always yeah. something new to learn about ourselves and about you know the world that yeah. that is has been in shadow or has been unknown to us i rem it reminds me uh, and and i completely agree with you about this this innate duality right mm -hmm. and and um uh, i'm a psychotherapist as well as a spiritual director and then and, and i see that in nearly every session that i sit with is our inclination to simplify and just try to just keep it down to the two buckets and of yeah. course that's not how reality works but um it also reminds me of one time somebody was referring to richard Rohr and said you know the thing about him that sets him apart in in this person's experience mm -hmm. was his undefendedness mm. yeah and of course that was an accurate assessment i think but going back to what you're talking about about this integration and then uh, i would i would bring in a buddhist ideas of radical acceptance right and and mm -hmm. you know not having attachments or preferences it results in being undefended yeah which i think would be frightening to most people and frightening to you and i on you know a daily basis just like everybody else but yeah i think spiritual uh understanding comes with this idea that we really ultimately have nothing to defend from mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right that mm -hmm. feelings are just feelings events yeah. are just events and so this 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 integration and acceptance of the things that are dark you know like union and shadow or whatnot um that it just really leads you to this place of of deep meaning and deep engagement with your yeah. with like you're talking about relational um with yourself with other people with the the big mystery and mm -hmm. so i what you're saying is just really really beautiful thank you um, and and i and i want to also just point out that you know one of the mistakes the reason dualism in terms of as a world view which basically dualism is what separates mind from body you know, it mm -hmm. separates the the uh, the opposites. It separates. Right. So this is the problem with dualism. It's not that it acknowledges that there are opposites, and what the it, and and when people 
uh, resist this, this tendency to, to have these two to bifurcate. They are right. What, what's needed is a sense of these as poles, not as mm -hmm. opposites that can ever be separated. So whether it's talking about light and dark, good or evil, masculine, feminine, up, down, you know, multiple, unified, they are like the poles of a battery or a magnet that can never be separated. You don't separate the positive and negative poles of a battery or of a magnet. So they are necessarily yeah. together. The problem is dualistic worldviews want to separate and preference one or the other over right. the other. Right. They want to lift up the, the masculine, you know, like in ancient Greece, lift up the masculine, uh, negate the feminine you know, lift yeah. up the spirit, negate the body. That's, yeah. that's the problem of dualism. It's not that you recognize that there are both mind and body and they're different, um, but that you don't, you believe that they can be separate as yeah. separate systems. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. And then expanding that out as you had earlier, thinking about Western culture being fragmented. Yeah, I mean, the ultimate result of that is that we create disconnection between ourselves as as humans, right. as right. citizens, as, yeah, and yeah, we know where that goes. Yeah, and we project out onto others the characteristics that we won't acknowledge mm. in ourselves. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, and, and that can go, you know, oftentimes people talk about Jungian shadow work and the, the shadow and they they talk about it as if it's only negative qualities but the shadow is just basically anything that's unknown to us about ourselves or unowned right. in us so right. we could have bright shadow aspects mm -hmm. we can have like if we were you know if I was a child that had been raised say in a very and this wasn't true for me but say I had been raised in a very scientific rationally oriented family and I was the artist you know, I was the romantic <laughs> artist. I would, I might be uh, in, uh, encouraged or discouraged from expressing those qualities. So if I was discouraged from being that, I would repress that into my shadow and yeah. I wouldn't then own my own artistry. Yeah. Yeah. I think that point is often overlooked when people are talking about shadow. Yeah. It, it was a little while before I heard somebody say that and I was blinking mm -hmm. going, oh, wow, that makes sense. But nobody had ever pointed that out before. So I'm really glad that you did. Yeah, thanks. Well, leaning into the, this Jungian uh, side as we have been, uh, say a little bit about dreams. Why, why are dreams important to spiritual growth or integration? Well, again, if the goal, if the process that's happening in the psyche is this compensatory process where the unconscious and, and you know, Jung talked about it, every person is having consciousness or ego consciousness. And for him, ego is not a bad word. Ego is having a being an individual, having a healthy set of boundaries and, and being an individual. Um, and so there's, there's our ego consciousness, and then there's the personal unconscious, but then he mm -hmm. also thought that there was a collective unconscious. And that collective unconscious is where, um, you know, the archetypes come from. And archetypes are just mm -hmm. patterns of human behavior or a tendency to have patterns of human behavior. So, you know, there's things like a mother archetype it's not the mother, the archetype, and this is interesting, he really separated later in his work, separated the archetype from the archetypal images. He said the archetypes themselves are empty of contents. They're just a tendency to have images collect around sort of a framework, like, a, like, a, like an energy template. And so he said, you know, different Ooh, cultures. I love that, an energy template. Yeah. I've never heard somebody call it archetypes that, but that's wonderful. And he kind of he kind of compares it to the way that that um, crystals will form in a solution, or, uh, and take on a structure. And you you wonder there's no lattice, there's no there's no uh, you know steel beam structure in the liquid that these crystals grow around to tell them how to grow. They just know how to do that. 
I mean, I use the yeah. word no loosely. So, right, right, so right. archetypes are kind of like an invisible lattice around which images collect. And so the images are culturally driven. Right. So um, anyway, so the unconscious gives us symbols. It brings up the, what is unconscious in symbolic form because the unconscious doesn't speak in language. language. Mm -hmm. So it has to use symbol. So dreams, and there are other ways as well, but Jung thought dreams were the, was the best way to be aware, become aware of what the unconscious was trying to show us and teach us through the symbols in our dreams. Now, people will say all the time, oh, I don't remember my dreams. Well, often when you set an intention to remember them and you put the notebook by the bed, you know, I've even had times when I was really like not remembering my dreams and really wanted to, I like put the notebook, the pen and a little flashlight on my bed, like right next to me. So that when I woke up, I could put the flashlight on, jot down the basic story and go back to sleep. And because dreams will, they're so ephemeral. If we move, if we open our eyes, if we mm -hmm. look around, they'll just be gone. Yep, so yep. Um, yeah, so to work with them in a spiritual way is basic. I mean, well, let me first mention this. I, I won't go into detail, but in, in ancient Greece, dreams were used. There were healing temples uh, around the god Asclepios that were used for healing physical disease where people would go and they had all kinds of tools they used. It was in a beautiful setting. So the setting itself, the place itself was evocative. Water, snakes, trees, music, art, mm. theater. It was all there. People would go who were sick and they would incubate dreams. And they believed that the dream was a visitation from the God, the healing God. And they would give the physicians insight into how to treat the disease. So this wow. is the way we used to look at dreams. With the rise of psychology, they became more symbolic of just, you know, what's happening in the inner psyche of people. But there are a lot of, I mean, there's, you know, there's uh, uh, for, in, in, I think all, almost all religious traditions, there's a sense that dreams were pointing to sacred realities. And there mm -hmm. are also, in indigenous cultures, practices where they believe that people are dreaming for their community. So there isn't just this psychological view of dreams as being representative of the inner psyche. But Jungian psychologists will usually talk about all the aspects of a dream as representing parts of ourselves. Even when we dream of people that are, that are real in our outer world, yeah. we would ask what they're representing to us psychologically and uh, so working with dreams then especially again like as a spiritual practice is being open to to ones whether you call open to god's help and communication or the higher self or the wisdom self and jung thought that there was an archetypal self a, a wholeness pattern in the psyche itself that mediated this this psychological process of compensation that mediated the symbols that came to us in dreams. And that that archetypal self was drawing us toward wholeness, toward integration. Mm -hmm. And so that then was that working with dreams is a way to become aware of what's happening at the unconscious level. And Jung said, if we don't, if we don't meet, uh, and work with the unconscious material as it arises, we will meet it later as illness or fate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I love that. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I had a wonderful experience many years ago. Uh, Pacifica on the West Coast was hosting a mythic imagination conference. <clears throat> oh, wow. And so, you know, James Hillman was there and, and Robert Bly and a bunch of people. But uh, in the evening gathering, uh, one evening, they, you know, were con concluding the program for the night. And they said, okay, one other thing. Tomorrow morning, we're going to start with Steven Eisenstadt and we're going to talk about 
dreaming in the collective unconscious. So please, mm. everybody, solicit from your unconscious a, a, a dream this evening mm-hmm. that will mm-hmm. be helpful. And tomorrow morning, be ready, you know, if called on to share your dream. So I went home and uh, I had this uh, dream about a blue, um, oh, shoot, what are those uh, fish called? Marlins. With, oh, a, yeah. with a huge, oh, yeah. so I was in the ocean and then there was this mm-hmm. marlin and then there was all sorts of blue fish swimming around. And so we went to the, we went to the event in the morning. And so Stephen had a big, you know, projector up on the screen and he says, okay, I just need one person to tell me your dream. And so they said their dream and it was a lot of blue it involved mm-hmm. water and there were fish. And so uh. he goes, okay, ha- anybody else was blue a predominant color in your dream? And like three quarters of the people to raise their hand. He said, like, anybody oh else dream of fish? And like three quarters of the people raise <gasps> their hand. Anybody yeah. else had a dream involving the water? And it was, it's, it was stunning. Yeah, It was stunning that mm-hmm. in a group of people who set an intention, thinking specifically about the collective unconscious and on a musmundi and that sort of thing. And mm-hmm. then it showed up, it manifested. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I just participated in an event in, uh, er- earlier this month called the Natural Spirituality Regional Gathering. Um, and this is a, a kind of community of people interested in dream work. And this is a, you know, we have a, it's been on Zoom the last couple of years. It used to be held up at Camp Michael in Tocoa, Georgia. And mm-hmm. it's kind of a community that rose up um, based on the work of Joyce Rockwood Hudson, who wrote a book, it's the first edition was called Natural Spirituality, Recovering the Wisdom Tradition in Christianity. And it was basically bringing together Jungian ideas and Christianity. And the book changed my life. And so it, I found mm-hmm. like my tribe, you know, through that. And now this, the second edition has a different subtitle, which I don't remember. I think it's something like Working with Dreams in Community, or I forget what it's, or spirituality and community or something like that. Anyway, um, we do that. We collect just, we just collect dream images and synchronicities at the beginning of the conference. And it can be really stunning oh, how you'll see common themes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so, it's very so, you know, firing of neurons. Yeah, okay. But it, isn't yeah. there more to that? Isn't there more? Well, and what I love, so I'll just mention two things and we won't have to go into any deep detail, but I did a a kind of pilot qualitative study back in 2014, where I interviewed five people who went, who attend the Hayden Hayden Institute's Summer Dream and Spirituality Conference and who were Mm -hmm. Christian and active in their faith and work regularly with their dreams. So I interviewed them about what is the nature of their experience of working with dreams and doing inner work. And, you know, they all talked about this as, you know, mystical experience and as being um, a, a pathway through which they encountered the sacred and, and felt like there, it was that not in every dream, but that many dreams were a source of divine communication and inspiration and guidance and healing and uh, support and that it changed the nature of their relationships well, the relationship with themselves, but also their relationships with God and others. Um, and that was just a tiny little study, but then that was, that's been my own experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then um, also, uh, it, you know, the interesting thing about bringing Whitehead into all this uh, is that he talks about perception in a way that's a little bit different. He has believes that we have two kinds of perception, that there's sensory perception, but then he also believes that we had, we mu- and he talks about why he, why we must kind of conclude that there must be this other kind of perception happening because he points to different reasons so I won't get into, but he believes that there's an unconscious perception where we're actually taking in the, in the whole world in every moment, mm-hmm. that if the, if everything is event based, that we're and this is what why his why his philosophy is seen as very relational. That everything we are like part of an interconnected web of events all the time, and we are always connected with all of those events of the past, and also with God who is presenting us new possibilities at every moment 
that we can actualize that are that are novel and that can be transformative. And so because of the way Whitehead looks at perception, then I talk about that we can, if his, if he's right, that mm -hmm. we can think about that we are taking, we are perceiving the world all the time through our bodies in a non-sensory, unconscious way. And then I kind of created this little theory that the vagus nerve is involved mm -hmm. in transmitting those impulses that we perceive of our environment and of all the world unconsciously and carry them up to the brain where then the brain turns them into images to help us understand our world and take the felt sense of the body, the emotion, you know, what the body is doing is it's, it's feeling emotion and sensing and feeling. It's all about patterns and aesthetics and image and feeling at that level of the unconscious body. And so mm -hmm. I, I make, you know, I mean, the scientists who study the vagus nerve talk about gut instincts. They talk about right. perceiving our environment. So yeah. I think it's. And that language has been around for centuries to exactly. have a gut feeling about something, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, and the vagus nerve, you know, has, goes all the way through the body down into the viscera, down into the organs. And, and you know, nerve have, nerves have fibers that go in both directions, afferent mm -hmm. and efferent fibers. So they are either moving away from the brain, carrying information away from the brain, or carrying information toward the brain. And the vagus nerve, 80% of its fibers move from the body to the brain. So its job is to communicate something, communicate the body's <laughs> input to the brain. Yeah. So anyway, that's how I bring them together, talking about dreams. That we, and that's why I say we can see dreams as natural and embodied while still being carriers of divine information. And that we, and again, based on white, we don't have to see God as supernatural. God and world are mutually imminent in Whitehead's mm -hmm. system, meaning just mutually interrelated, present within each other all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty pan panentheistic. Exactly. Exactly. View. Yeah. That's that's wonderful. Yeah. So, you know, we're we're talking about dreams and working with that as a spiritual process. Um yeah, I just wanted to throw out there that uh, as an organization, we agree with that very much too. And so for people who attend our program to train you how to be a spiritual director, we mm -hmm. have uh, we have a specific course just on working with dreams, with yourself and with other people. And um, yeah. Pam Muller uh, from the Hayden Institute yeah. uh, teaches that for us. Great. So, yeah, I know yeah Pam. it's really She's great. great. Mm -hmm. she is yeah we're mm -hmm. really excited to have her as one of our teachers Yay. so uh, other than dream work uh of yours sherry do do you have any other favorite spiritual practices that this work has informed for you well i've 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 always journaled to, to one degree or another i think writing out feelings and um you know not just dreams but just feelings about life and the world that's been a real key part of my practices but the and but another piece is i would say that intersection between synchronicities and the natural world so you know jung talked about synchronicities as meaningful coincidences when the mm -hmm. outer world mirrors something that's happening in our inner world and and i'll tell you a quick little story but i but i want to mention so part again and i i've only recently been calling this a spiritual practice but i feel very strongly that it is you know, I've always loved animals. I mean, since I was, you know, really tiny, always been drawn toward animals. And, and I don't just mean, you know, the cute furry cats and dogs, you know, I, I really <laughs> am drawn toward, toward the, the creatures in the natural world. Now I have to say, I'll, 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 I'll own up to the fact that I, I eat animals. So like, that's a tension, you know, so just to, th just to say, I'm not going to, mm -hmm act like I'm some hot holier than thou. But I, when I go out in the world, if whenever I see anything alive out there, whether it's a bird or whether it's, you know, the, like the, 
squirrels and raccoons that I see around here or the Muscovy ducks in my apartment complex or other people's <laughs> dogs and cats, I greet every one of them whenever I, when I can, you know, when I recognize that they're there, I say, good morning. I greet the mm-hmm. other creatures. And I, and, and I really think that the reason I say that that's a spiritual practice is because it reminds us of our kinship relationship to these other beings in our world. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, when I moved, I lived in, in Marietta, you know, that side Atlanta there for many, many years, and then moved up to the Northeast Georgia mountains and was living in Demarest right outside Clarksville. Th- that I feel is the home of my soul and always will be that Saute Nacuchi Valley and, mm-hmm. and Habersham County. That, that is a very meaningful landscape to me. And I moved up there and I rented this beautiful little hundred year old house on eight acres of land with an old barn and a lake at the back and a creek and woods and pasture. It was, it was heaven. It was on a very busy road and the house was right by the road. So that was a downside. But I have never felt before, had not felt to that point, but with that place, I was in a relationship with that house and that land. And I Mm. felt loved by that house and I loved it. And I felt Mm. like it came alive in me when I lived there. And other people would say, your house looks so happy. And I felt that. I felt like I had a relationship. So I think we can feel less alone when we engage with the other beings in our world. I think we feel less alone. Yeah. I mean, even the lizards, you know, we have a lot of those little anoli lizards and we have geckos that come out at night you know i don't say necessarily say hi to every single one of them but i will sometimes (laughs) say hi to them and i'll try to you know catch if they come in the house get them before the cat does and uh (laughs) saw a black snake the other day and as long as i see them first and they go by i I, especially the the non-poisonous snakes i I'm happy they're there. I've been rescuing baby raccoons out of the dumpster. They get stuck in the dumpster when it's empty and they can't climb out. So I keep sticks around and I stick the stick down and they climb out and until they're bigger than they can get out on their own. But when they're little, they can't and they don't know, you know. Oh, that's, (laughs) I love that. I love that being, being amongst the other sentient beings of the yeah, of the yeah, world yeah that's great well sherry i thank you so much for this uh brief but so chock full of yummy stuff and um i i suspect people will want to be knowing more of what's going on with you so first yeah. i just want to give them real quick uh let our listeners know that sherry will be doing a workshop for zeitgeist on the whole making nearness of God. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful title? And um, so that's going to be happening on Saturday, March 26th, 2022, from 9.30 in the morning till three in the afternoon. And this will be uh, via Zoom. And so you can learn more about that workshop at our website, ZGATL. Dot org. But Sherry, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what people can expect from that day? Yeah, so we'll be, um, it'll be kind of a, you know, teaching and retreat, uh, yeah. alternating kind of a day. So the morning will be, uh, I'll be talking about the whole making nearness of God and bringing in, you know, Whitehead, Jung, maybe a little bit of Richard Rohr to talk about how, again, at the, at the level of the cosmos and the psyche, I think that there's a whole making function of reality, that reality is both wounding and healing, and that's just inherent to it. So yeah. the morning we'll spend, um, talking about those things and i'll probably talk a little bit about dream work and about you know as a spiritual practice and then in the afternoon i'm going to take people through a practice i created called dream divina which is um where we look each person will have their own dream in mind and it's a sort of guided meditation type process where we look at a dream in a contemplative way and um we'll kind of spread that out through the afternoon so people have some time for reflection and 
and then we'll have discussion. So they'll, the whole day will be kind of alternating between teaching and reflection and discussion and stuff oh, like that. Sounds exciting. I'm, I'm <laughs> very, you. very much looking forward to it. Me so too. Sheree, what else are you doing? How else can people connect with you and, and learn more about what you're doing and, and reap the benefits of having met you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. I So sherrycling.com is my website. Now, I um, right now I'm kind of doing a combination of things. I'm offering some online classes. So I have a class coming up through the Cobb Institute starting March mm -hmm. 1st on Whitehead and Young and Meeting God in Our Dreams. So that's going to be a six session course all online that I'll be teaching starting March 1st on, I think that's on Tuesday nights. And, um, but then I do one-on-one -on -one coaching, you know, I call it transformation coaching, or I might, I might start calling myself the wholeness coach or something like that. Okay. Um, I like it. But basically working one-on-one -on -one people, one-on-one -on -one with people in uh, kind of three key areas that's just sort of psycho-spiritual wholeness, you know, like, so that's kind of a more spiritual leaning, um, type of coaching, working one-on-one -on -one with people, doing one-on-one -on -one dream work. So that could be just a real focus type of work and also mm -hmm. vocational coaching, you know, like how can people come to uh, kind of understand their pathway and what is the work of their heart and soul and how can they integrate their past experience with, you know, what might they be looking to consider in terms of new directions and so I do that kind of work with people and then I um transforming women is a program that I've created and actually has its own website transformingwomen.net but you can get to it of course through sherrycling.com but that's basically where I um have both sort of a professional development seminar series that I can offer companies and also will be doing, I'm doing one-on-one -on -one work with people, but we'll be also doing courses around that. But it's based around some key archetypal transformation patterns, stories that are especially geared toward the uh, transformation and wholeness of the feminine and mm -hmm. the, the journey of the feminine. And so, uh, or, you know, the women women's journeys. And, and so the stories that I bring in are stories that had been life-changing for me that that helped me whenever I've been stuck or felt like I didn't know what was happening in my life or how to understand my life. Stories would fall into my lap that provided me a way to look at my life as being part of a bigger whole. And, you know, Jung talks about that one of the problems in modern society is that people don't have a story, a, a shared myth anymore that explains mm -hmm. the wholeness of the world that so that mm -hmm. that wholeness of the world can then facilitate our individual wholeness. And that's yeah. what these stories do. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, I'll make sure that we've got the links for that in the show notes and Thank folks you. can, um, can, learn more about those opportunities and hopefully um, engage with those. And uh, we would love to see everybody at the Zoom workshop um, yeah. for the whole making nearness of God. So Sherry, thank you again so much for spending the time with us. Uh, we're really looking forward to going deeper with that. Thanks so and much, we'll Devin. consider you a partner for Zeitgeist. This is Yay. just wonderful. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.